Ah, and we are live and welcome everybody. Here we are at the second of the Sportworks Tech Talks. And today we are talking very deeply about fan behavior and their digital habits. Um, as we've seen, sport is back. And of course, first and foremost, sport is back with the world's leading football league. The Premier League started last week with a number of matches. Um, with all of the top teams uh, performing, playing uh, across across the breadth of the UK. Um, behind the scenes, a lot of those subscriptions were handled by a company called MPP Global. And we are really lucky today to have not only the CEO of MPP Global, Paul Johnson, who was one of the founders of the company, he's been there 20 years, he's helped build the business, handle business development, He's an engineer by degree uh, and is now the CEO of a company which has 20 million active subscribers across the world, around a billion pounds in turnover per year, and a roster of clients as diverse as Sky Sports, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, L'Equipe, uh, NBC Universal, One Soccer, the German Channel, UK TV, and not to forget the Professional Squash Association. Perhaps not the biggest client, but great to see that MPP Global is working very, very closely with, with Sport Federation as well. Paul, if you'd just like to do a brief introduction, and then we will play a short video just to set the scene. Yeah, thanks, Guy. Um, well, perhaps no further introduction is needed. That was a, a very good one. Just pick up on one thing. Um, our turnover isn't a billion dollars. I, I wish it was, uh, but we do turn over a billion more on behalf of our clients um, and as Chris says I'm the, the CEO and co-founder of MPP Globe. Um, very pleased to be here and hopefully give you some insight into subscriber management and what that means from a media point of view as well as a sports point of view. Fantastic and I'm Guy Horn, I'm your moderator for today um, and I run a small media company called HNA media and we are working very much with federations, host cities and governments to, to develop digital platforms for sport across the world. Without much ado, we will go straight into a quick mood video. You know, you know me. I've always, I've always just, just been there. Been there. I've, shaped I've shaped people, communities, communities and, countries. and countries. I've been caught, I've been caught up in controversy. And sometimes, and sometimes made, no made no apology. Millions, Millions have, have relied on me. But I, but I rely on you. Now, now more, than more than ever. You see, you see we're, we're not bound by 90,000 stadiums or first, first place medals. medals. We're, we're united, united by a passion. And counting the days, days until we make a grand return. But, but until then, until then enjoy, enjoy your, your, your Augusta, your new camp, your, camp, your, lords, your lords, and make home, and make home advantage, advantage count. count. I am sport, I'm sport but I am but nothing. I am nothing. So uh, that was um, a little advert that Sky Sports put out uh, to get everyone in the mood as uh, sports was restarted both in the UK and around the world. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in the introductions, uh, MPP Global, we're a SaaS company. We provide subscriber management services to publishing, TV, and the sports sectors. Um, and three months ago, something very strange happened to us all, and the world as we know it was locked down almost instantaneously. And with the lockdowns, we saw an overnight explosion in media consumption, and at the same time, all live sports were suspended. The consequences for the media and sports industries couldn't have been more different. Working in these sectors really gives MPP Global a unique vantage point 
from which we can draw insights and share experiences from the media sector. And now is the perfect time to do so, because as live sports are restarted, the sports sector is in the exact situation that media was in three months ago. I will share with you the lessons learned from the media sector and how sport can embrace the same tactics to drive subscriptions and to minimize churn. Mainstream OTT news and media have benefited greatly from the global lockdowns and those with recurring subscription revenues have benefited the most since they have seen huge, huge spikes in subscriber numbers. For example, Disney Plus, whose launch in the UK coincided almost identically with the lockdowns, will have 4.3 million new subscribers by the end of June. An incredible 4 million subscriptions from a standing start in just a few weeks. This puts the service behind the more established Netflix and Amazon Prime, but already ahead of Sky's Now TV and ITV and BBC's BritBox. Whilst the numbers are staggering, I guess we should not be too surprised. People were being furloughed, schools were closed, and none of us could do any of the things that we love, love to do. And so people kept themselves engaged by doing more of the things they can do at home. And this included going online more and watching videos more, a lot more. While media took off, sports tanked. We can see that from the stats when we analyzed our own data. And in the weeks following the coronavirus lockdown, media companies made hay whilst the sun was shining. Colloquially known as the Corona Boom, media companies accelerated their subscriber bases with massive gains. Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, Now TV all reported huge surge in subscriber numbers. The picture was not so rosy for companies in the sports sector. Across our own sports clients, subscriptions started to wane more rapidly after about four weeks as monthly subscriptions began to expire. Of course, without any live sports to watch on TV or online, this is hardly surprising. Sports is having a tough time with projections proposed at some $60 billion in losses before the year is out. But sport is restarting and now is the time to capitalize. Sport is back. You can see from this slide that sport is returning in a big way over the next few weeks. All the major sports are returning, which is set to delight sports fans all around the world. Many of the events canceled this year, like the Olympics, Euro 2020, Copper America, will fill our calendars next year. This year, events like the French Open will be in, se in September instead of May. The Tour de France will start in August, two months later than normal. The Ryder Cup and Lions Rugby Tours remain undecided. But what is clear is that all of these major events we have, badly, have so badly missed will begin again over the next three months and in the year to come. This will provide all sports fans with a feast of content for a year or more. And with that, opportunities beckon. For example, the return of the English Premier League last week and Manchester City's 3-0 victory over Arsenal was the most watched Premier League match in more than three years with a peak audience of over 3.4 million viewers. It also became the most viewed ever match on Sky Sports, not featuring Manchester United or Liverpool. The BBC, showing their first league game for over 30 years, attracted 3.9 million viewers for the match between Bournemouth and Crystal Palace. That was, of course, free to air, hence the slight increase. And hot off the press, Liverpool became record breakers yet again attracting 5.5 million viewers for the game against Everton on Sunday. 
But let us take a moment to look at the big hole in the middle of the sports calendar. When there were no live sports anywhere, there can be no doubt that media companies helped fill this void. And sports fans turned to news and entertainment sources to fill their entertainment vacuum and find new places to spend their finite budgets. Sport is back now, but what is sports going to do to win back discretionary spend? And how can we look, apply the lessons learned not only now, but in future years when single sports services have an off season? Let us look then at the strategies of media companies during the last three months and how they accelerated and capitalized on captive lockdown market and how sports can adopt similar strategies as live sports returns to our screens. As lockdowns kept people at home, the opportunity for media companies to attract new subscribers was at its highest. So how do we capitalize on this captive market? Our partners at Jellyfish, who operate the UK's leading magazine subscription service, witnessed huge spikes in subscribers, particularly in printed magazines, which more than doubled that of digital. Kids' titles increased by a whopping 500%, home and gardening up 400%, and women's titles up 300%. Given the nature of the lockdown, it's no surprise to see those particular genres doing so well. The advice from Jellyfish is very simple. To scale and capitalize during the growth times, you still need to make your brand visible in the digital landscape and running paid media campaigns is key. In their campaigns, publishers called out offers, such as free delivery. They told us we could have free access to digital editions and promoted their other USPs. Publishers realized more people search on their mobiles, and so campaigns were mobile friendly and mobile first. They worked hard to make sure campaigns were at times of the day when search and signups were at their highest. Publishers didn't forget about social, and they made sure they had a killer and slick landing page to ensure conversion. Whilst campaigning and brand awareness is crucial, so too is offering a range of payment types, the types which offer least friction. PayPal and in-app purchasing are good examples of this. And modern day devices are more sophisticated and securely store credit card details, which can then be auto populated into payment forms, which makes life really easy for consumers. Content, content, content. Content is key. And without compulsive and must have content, even the best campaigns will stutter and churn rates will be high. Content is central to promotional campaigns, and even better, so too is word of mouth to help drive subscription volumes. Frozen 2 was made available on Disney Plus three months ahead of schedule, and along with the hit TV series Mandalorian, helped Disney accelerate subscription volumes so quickly. The highly acclaimed Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, wasn't supposed to launch until the NBA Finals in June, but instead was released two months earlier. This helped Netflix add 16 million new subscribers in Q1, which was more than double Q4 last year. The key takeaway for sports is that having great exclusive or niche content is the most important factor, but to truly capitalize on sports return, is to shout from the rooftops and ensure all your customers know it too. With great content and widespread promotion, driving people to your website in their droves and having a slick landing page to convert visitors into paying subscribers, 
Now is the time to get people over the line and paying for a subscription with a great offer, with a great discount. But only if you have to. Great content doesn't always need a big discount to get people subscribing. And discounts which are too big or too enticing will often lead to much higher churn later on. The challenge is getting the balance just right. As we know, everyone likes a discount or something for nothing. With free trials, low start offers, or limited time offers in conjunction with a discount code, we can get really creative on how we convert people into paying customers. Sky Sports and BT Sports slashed their prices ahead of the English Premier League returning. Fans will now be able to get Now TV's Sky Sports month pass for £20 per month instead of 40 BT Sport reduced their big sport package by exactly the same amount. Media companies also offered upsell opportunities to increase ARPU within their existing subscriber base. Not only does this increase revenues, but it helps to reinforce brand loyalty and value for money. For example, Sky recognized that more people would be at home because of the lockdown and wanting to share a better family subscription experience. So Sky offered a service called Boost, which provides OTT and full 1080 pixel HD, Dolby surround sound, the ability to watch on three devices concurrently and having up to six devices registered on a single account. Virgin Media didn't upsell anything, but promoted brand loyalty by simply giving them a 10 gigabyte boost to their data bundle every month. They also gave their customers an additional bunch of free to air TV channels, um, and they made visits to NHS websites free so that they didn't consume data from data bundles. They also upgraded broadband customers from a super fast to ultra fast broadband connections for free. Freemium and free to air models were also very popular. Newspapers relaxed paywalls so that COVID-19 related content remained free at all times. Sling TV in the US created a registration wall which made all their free to air content available after you registered an account. The NBA, the PGA, the MLB all opened up free access to their content archives. The key takeaway for sports is to balance the strength of sports content and the breadth of marketing campaigns with the attractiveness of the offer or trial. Competition may force your hand, but whilst discounting too much will most certainly lead to a short-term upside, it will also lead to churn in the longer term. Pricing. I don't think anyone thinks a humanitarian crisis is the time to increase prices. The rest is open to creativity and marketing prowess. Pricing is allied with promotional activities and when attracting new subscribers cannot be separated. Many publishers offered large discounts or removed subscription fees and unlocked their paywall. OTT and pay TV companies paused payments altogether in some cases. Bloomberg, for example, used discounted pricing to offer a two year subscription to their customers. And why wouldn't they? Long-term subscribers are far more valuable than monthly subscribers. But it came with a warning. As Bloomberg's global head of subscription and consumer marketing said, the lower you go with pricing, the higher your churn is going to be. And so striking that balance is really important. Alongside the two-year subscription, Bloomberg also offered monthly and annual subscriptions. And here they were really smart. They applied what, what is known as the rule of three, which psychologically attracts people to the middle offer, 
not the most expensive, not the cheapest, the one in the middle. The one in the middle was an annual subscription. NZME, owners of the New Zealand Herald, experienced a surge in online subscriptions in the past four months, racking up nearly 70,000 new subscribers, 25% of whom signed up to the annual subscription. The Irish Times offered a free Echo Dot and the New York Times offered attractive discounts to 12-month subscriptions. The Standard, the Austrian newspaper, introduced an innovative contributions model as the pandemic picked up pace. They did this by offering free access to high quality news and asking for a donation if their customers appreciated the level of journalism and the lack of fake news. At present, they're experiencing a revenue split of around 25% from donations and 75% from recurring subscriptions. They have already met their donations target, a figure they didn't think they would reach until the end of the year. So what can sports learn? If you price too low, you could be missing out on revenues during a boom and increase the cost of churn later. Pitching a longer term subscription with a modest discount improves lifetime value. Our fourth lesson and our final lesson, retention and churn. We've discussed pricing being allied to promotions and as we have also mentioned, it is also linked with churn. Long-term subscriptions considers what will happen as people get back to their normal lives in a post-lockdown world and churn levels may start to increase. Having subscribers locked in for one or even two years is a great way to reduce churn. Niche content and sports content are the worst for chronic, burner, uh, chronic churners, according to Boston Consulting Group. Up to 30% of the subscriber base cancelling and resubscribing two or more times in a two year period, compared to less than 10% for core content providers like Netflix and Amazon Prime. This goes some way to underline the desire to maximize conversion rates to long term subscriptions. At the same time, and the flip side, is if we accept that sports content naturally attracts customers on a transient, seasonal or per live event basis, offering day passes or event passes becomes a viable option. This has proven very popular with Dow TV in the UK. For example, one Sunday a few years ago, you were able to watch Masters Golf, Ashes Test Match Cricket, a Formula One race, Manchester United versus Manchester City on a single day with a single Sky Sports day pass, which proves to be excellent value for money. Convenience is key for regular purchasers of day passes, making it easy for your customer to sign in and one click purchase a day pass to provide seamless access to great sporting action. But you cannot stop there. As life gets back to normal, we have to work to hard to keep subscribers and avoid the churn and burn factor, which is a real fear within publishing. Clever off-boarding cancellation journeys can be introduced to try and steer customers away from cancellations with exit surveys that guide subscribers to a more suitable package, the ability to pause, or even provide a unique offer based on their consumption patterns. Of course, that means continuing to provide great live sports, but that might not be enough to avoid churn and providing subscribers with more than they expect will be important. This can include exclusive interviews, a broad archive, podcasts, exclusive content, watch alongs, esports, and more.
You can also use algorithms and technology to predict churn and use past consumption behavior to promote upcoming content which will appeal to consumers. Or if you can see someone has been a light user in a given month, surprise them by giving them some credit which they can use in future months. Let's not forget about involuntary churn. It is amazing how many subscribers are lost because a payment cannot be collected. MPP Global would work with a large OTT client who was experienced, experiencing 10% monthly churn due to payment declines. Not because people wanted to cancel, it's because we couldn't collect a payment through no fault of our own. To combat this, we implemented a series of technology improvements that included suppression windows, multiple payment retries, and card data services, which is when you request a new credit card number from the card schemes when a card is reported stolen or if it has expired. This resulted in reducing involuntary churn from 10% to under 1%. And again, let us let, let me state the obvious. Great content leads to loyal customers. If you can, create as much habitual content as you can to complement your live sports events. And you will see fewer cancellations from those monthly subscribers. And especially those who subscribe and cancel, subscribe and cancel. So what should sports be doing to reduce churn when the excitement of sports return begins to wane? Firstly, think about long-term subscriptions and secondly, use technology to predict churn before it happens and prevent involuntary churn caused by payment declines. So the key takeaways, the final slide and a few conclusions. Um, firstly, provide attractive discounts, but not too attractive that you miss revenue opportunities and increase short term churn. Long term subscriptions increase lifetime value. Use technology to predict voluntary churn and kill involuntary churn. And finally, and most importantly, serial content is king. Content which becomes habitual with your customer base outside of live sports creates a strong and loyal customer base. That's it from me, Guy. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've, uh, we're well on time and we have quite a wide variety of questions here to ask you. Um, looking to the future, I have a question from Jane Balance here. You've, you've clearly mastered standard means of payment, direct debit, credit card. Tell us about what exotic means of payment you would envisage in the future. Do we have any of your clients accepting cryptocurrency payment? Or what about uh, microtransactions from Indonesia? What about Chinese apps with renminbi conversions? How does all that work? Well, we, we haven't gone quite as far as cryptocurrency as of yet. Um, but micropayments is something we've been used to for, well, 20 years. I, I remember myself designing some of the database tables all those years ago, which supported what we call service credits. Um, but, but really what, what our clients need to do is figure out the regions and the territories where they want to push content, where they want to build a new subscription base. And they need to look at the, the payment types that are most common to that region. Um, you know, if you look anywhere across Europe, you know, bank transfer, SEPA is the big method of payment. And that's relatively recent before then it was gyro pay in germany ideal in the netherlands so forth in other regions around europe um so yeah those are important payment types everybody's got a credit card 
especially in North America, you know, to have something other than credit card and PayPal would be slightly unusual. Um, In-app purchasing has become very popular because it's so easy. Um, so, you know, my message, my recommendation is use the ones that are common in a given region. Definitely pick the ones that are the easiest, that make that seamless journey from visitor to paying customer. Um, and when it comes to the Far East and, and those areas with um, where mobile phones is such a popular method of, of currency, then definitely include direct carrier billing as part of your payments mix. I've got a question here from uh, Michel Kute from Lausanne, and, and his question is more about the the treatment of data. You know, MVP is privileged to carry very valuable data from each of these clients, uh, confidential data and purchasing habits. Uh, obviously, GDPR applies uh, in this case, but how is that data used? How is it shared? How much do you use to third parties, for example? Um, and do people mind or, and actually are happy that they're actually modeled and targeted? Um, I think, you know, obviously, obviously data is, 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 especially with the advent of GDPR, it's top of mind and, and everyone is, is very sensitive to, to that data. We, we've actually lost contracts or not been able to negotiate contracts because there was a a disconnect between the obligations between the data processor and the data controller and having that you know everything was so new everyone was fearful obviously four percent of, of global turnover is a fine if you mishandle data scares everybody um but, but you heard me in my presentation talk about promoting usps and, and the security of data is one of ours um, because we have been processing credit cards for probably 18 years, um, that means we have been PCI compliant for that amount of time as well. And PCI is the payment card industry data security standard, which governs the strength and the security of credit card numbers in a database. So when GDPR came along, it was very easy for us to apply the same security protocols that we do to credit cards as we do to personal identifiable data because all that data is in the same database. Yeah. So all of the firewalls, all of the pen testing, all of the external audits that we do two or three times a year, all of that governance and, and best practice had already been applied to credit card numbers. And so to extend that to GDPR-based data was very easy for us. Got a question here from Kieran Quinn in, um, down in France, I think. Um, and the question is very much that, do we see sports and sports channels competing with these major entertainment companies? Are we fighting for the same spend? Will sport come back and, and take revenue and market share from entertainment companies? How do you see the pot developing? Is the pot going to grow or are they going to be fighting entertainment versus live sport? Well, I, I think if we cast our minds back to one of the slides which showed that big gap in live sports of three months whilst all, all sports were suspended, then there can be little doubt that many of the people that subscribe to sports services started to spend their money elsewhere. They might have subscribed to Netflix for the first time. So I think there's, I don't have any data around it. I could, we can probably try and look into that. Um, but there's no doubt that people will have filled that vacuum of entertainment or sports vacuum with entertainment. Um, and so, yes, we, we, we do, as sports organisations or organisations servicing the sports sector, we've now got a fight on our hands to try and win back that discretionary spend. And as, heard, as you heard me mention, you know, numerous times in the presentation, you know, what sports companies have that not all entertainment companies have is live sports, exclusive sports action. And so we must harness the power of content to win back those subscribers. Yeah. 
And I'm gonna I'm gonna just use one of your clients as an example, and it's a sports client, and it's the sport of squash. And Squash TV has been operating now for over five years. Um, it's marketed, I think, through one of the Eurosport platforms as well. But Squash TV has a free a free component and also a pay per view component. Um, they have, I think, overall nearly 700,000 subscribers, including free access and web visitors, but that's the database size. And every youngster, family, brother, mother who's playing can obviously watch, watch to see how it's going. And I choose this sport because one, it's a close contact sport, so it's absolutely as threatened as any other in the post-COVID world. And yet, I think in Manchester, the national team will start training in the next couple of weeks uh, without any contact measures. They've allowed that. So that's a great example in the UK. And secondly, it's a non-Olympic sport. It gets no benefit of that funding. And through their own devices, they've decided having their own platform, having their own channel, going OTT to reach directly and knowing their fans, they've made that investment. So that kind of gives you a sense that you don't have to be Netflix to go through this type of system. Uh, and I think it, it stood out for me from your roster of clients. And that, that's great that for, for you guys, it's just a customer, isn't it? It's the same data application pool, I guess, isn't it? Well, it, exactly that. Um, you know, some of our bigger clients, um, you know, they've got some wacky custom requirements that we need to put in. Um, yeah, that's fairly frequent occurrence. Um, so it's great when a client will look at our eSuite platform and see that it delivers all of their requirements out the box. And I think you know the implementation was was straightforward. We we got them live pretty quickly. We didn't have to do anything unusual, um, and the service you know is is live and. You know, hopefully some of the messages from today can be applied to some of those 700,000 non-paying subscribers to help get them over the line and into a paying subscriber mode to, to really flush, you know, a new source of revenue in, into the Squash Association. And do you have an opinion on frequency of events? A question here from Johnny Merch of Red Torch. What... What's the frequency? What's the optimal frequency? Have you do you sense the minimum number of events? Um, well, it's, it's a difficult one. I don't think any one hat fits every every service provider. Um, you know, it's the quality of those events which are important, and if they tend to be less frequent then applying an event ticket or a day pass to that event is probably going to be more tuned to that customer base if you've got content you know where you've got live events which may be one or two a week as a minimum um, that would probably be the kind of frequency that would then start to make a monthly subscription make sense nobody is going to want to pay for a monthly subscription where you've got maybe two or three weeks of inactivity so you know, though, though it's yeah, it's the frequency and then the billing model. Those two things go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. I think the answer to that one as well is you'll only find out when you try, and once you put your toe in the water, yeah, you'll have some knowledge, and you'll have a customer base for who's watched it live. You'll have a yeah. customer base for who's watched it on replay, rewind, and tried to share it as well. So. You know, rich, rich in, rich in data, which is uh, very good. Uh, I think that is probably the last uh, question. Um, it's been an absolutely tremendous uh, and really timely discussion with Paul Johnson of MPP Global. Paul, thank you very much indeed uh, for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure, uh, and we look forward to welcoming you back in the future. I'm, I'm, I'm sensing 12 months on. We would love to see whether the sport is back in the ring and wearing the blue shorts, and is going to win on points or in a KO versus uh, entertainment or other genres. So you know, we're all rooting for sports here. Um, the next session we will have on next Thursday, we have Thomas Juno, who runs the UA for Academy, talking about education for footballers. Um, and that will be next Thursday at CET 10.
But apart from that, that's the end of today. And thank you very much, Paul Johnson of MPP. Thank you.